obviously kind of the holy grail when it comes to implantable system is to kind of understand how small of a thing you can make. And a lot of that is driven by how much energy or how much power you can supply to it and how you extract data from it. So at the time at Berkeley, there was kind of this, this uh, desire to kind of understand in the neural space what, what, what sort of system you can build to really miniaturize these implantable systems. And uh, I distinct, distinctively remember this one uh, particular meeting where Michel came in and he's like, guys, I think I have a solution. The solution is ultrasound. <laughs> and, uh, and then he proceeded to kind of walk through why that is the case. And that, that really formed the basis for my thesis work um, uh, called Neural Dust mm -hmm. System that was looking at ways to use ultrasound as opposed to uh, electromagnetic waves mm -hmm. for powering as well as communication. I guess I should step back and say the, the initial goal of the project was to build these tiny, about the size of a neuron implantable system that can be parked next to a neuron, being able to record its state and being able to ping that back to the outside world for doing something useful. And as I mentioned, the size of the implantable system is limited by how you power the thing and get the data off of it. And at the end of the day, fundamentally, if you look at a human body, we're uh, essentially a bag of salt water with some interesting proteins and chemicals, but uh, it, it's, it's mostly salt water that's very, very well temperature regulated at 37 degrees Celsius. Um, and we'll, we'll get into how, why, and, and later why that's uh, an extremely harsh environment for any electronics to survive, as I'm sure you've experienced or maybe not experienced, you know, dropping cell phone in a, in a salt water, in an ocean, it will instantly kill the device, right? Um, but anyways, uh, just in general, electromagnetic waves don't penetrate through this environment well. Um, and it, just the speed of light, it is what it is. We can't, we can't change it. And based on the, um, the wavelength at which you are interfacing with the device, it, the device just needs to be big. Like these inductors needs to be quite big. Um, and the general good rule of thumb is that you want the wavefront to be roughly on the order of the size of the thing that you're interfacing with. So an implantable system uh, that is around 10 to 100 micron in dimension, in, in, in a volume, which is about the size of a neuron that you see in a, in a human body. Um, you would have to operate at like hundreds of gigahertz, which number one, not only is it difficult to build electronics operating at those frequencies, but also the body just attenuates that very, very significantly. So the interesting kind of insight of this ultrasound um, was the fact that ultrasound just travels a lot more effectively in the human body tissue compared to electromagnetic waves. And this is something that you encounter, uh, and you, I'm sure most people have encountered in their lives when you go to um, you know, hospitals that are medical uh, ultrasound you know, sonograph, right? Um, and they go into very, very deep depth without attenuating too much, too much of the signal. So, all in all, you know, ultrasound, the fact that it travels through the body extremely well, and the mechanism to which it travels to, to the body really well is that just the wavefront is very different. It's uh, electromagnetic waves are transverse, whereas in ultrasound waves are compressive. So it's just a completely different mode of uh, wavefront propagation. Um, and as well as speed of sound is orders and orders of magnitude less than speed of light which means that even at 10 megahertz ultrasound wave, your wavefront ultimately is a very, very small wavelength. Mm -hmm. So if you're talking about interfacing with the 10 micron or 100 micron type structure, you would have 150 micron wavefront at 10 megahertz and building electronics at those, mega, uh, at, at those frequencies are much, much easier and they're a lot more efficient. So the basic idea kind of was born out of um, you know, using ultrasound as a mechanism for powering the device and then also getting data back. So now the question is, how do you get the data back? The mechanism to which we landed on is what's called backscattering. Um, this is actually something that is very common and that we interface 
on a day-to-day -day basis with our RFID cards, you know, a radio frequency ID tags, where there's actually rarely, you know, in your ID, a battery inside. There's an antenna and there's some sort of uh, coil that has your serial uh, identification ID. And then there's an external device called a reader that then sends a wavefront and then you reflect back that wavefront with some sort of modulation that's unique to your ID. Mm -hmm. That's that's what's called backscattering uh, fundamentally. So the tag itself actually doesn't have to consume that much energy. And um, that was the mechanism to which we were kind of thinking about sending the data back. So when you have an external uh, ultrasonic transducer that's sending ultrasonic wave to your implant, the neural dust implant, and it records some information about its environment, whether it's a neuron firing or uh, some other state of um, the uh, the tissue that it's interfacing with. And then it just amplitude modulates the wavefront that comes back to the source. And the recording step would be the only one that requires any energy. So what would require energy in that little step? Correct. So it, it is that initial kind of startup circuitry mm -hmm. to get that recording, amplifying it, and then just modulating. Mm -hmm. And the mechanism to which that that you can enable that is there is this specialized crystal called piezoelectric crystals that are able to convert sound energy into electrical energy and vice versa. So you can kind of have this interpa interplay between the ultrasonic domain and electrical domain that is the, the biological tissue.